All right, very good, thank you. Um, so I want to take a chance to thank um, Drs. Nixon and Hernandez and Mackesy for spending this time with us. We're at the end of our hour, but I'm um, happy to stay on here and answer some questions. Um, if you do have to jump off of the webinar, then you know the, the questions and uh, the recording will be archived and, and you'll be able to go back later and look at those. Um, so for those that are staying on, uh, we'll answer some questions. For those that need to um, jump off of here, I would just ask that when um, the evaluation questions pop up on your screen, that you take a minute to answer those. And um, so thanks to everyone for participating today. And uh, we'll, we'll look at our questions now and, and spend a little bit of time answering those. And I would encourage you too, if there's something that you heard today that you thought was particularly helpful or interesting, um, please share that with us as well. Um, if there's a new method that you think you might try in your science communication efforts. So Mara, maybe I'll let you handle the, the chat box and, and ask some of the questions. Sure, uh, so we have a question here about how we can measure critical thinking skills, uh, specifically like how we can build them in a K through 12 education and, and maintain that through the adult life. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll start out on that one. Um, I think that what is really exciting and promising is that there is so much more STEM work being done in a K through 12 environment. And there is very much uh, more of a movement toward incorporating communication in those efforts. Um, so we're seeing quite a few designated science communication courses, perhaps not during K through 12, um, but you know, during uh, professional exchanges in higher education. Um, and so hopefully that is going to continue to influence um, earlier years of education as well, because those are so formative. Okay, we got a question here. Um, about uh, what will what will be the most effective way to communicate mig to migrant and resident uh, farm workers about COVID-19 safety at and outside of the work environment? So Leah and Amy and I happen to be working on a project about almost exactly this, but I'm gonna volunteer you, Leah, to answer. <laughs> okay. So if I want to be totally forthcoming with my hypercritical health disparities brain, um, it kind of goes back to the question I mentioned earlier about um, understanding whether or not the recommendations are feasible for certain populations and then also keeping in mind whether or not the populations um, are able to follow through with them and that they have what they need to do so, right? So as we know, COVID has disproportionately negatively impacted uh, migrant laborers of color uh, for several of the reasons we've already mentioned so far. And um, I think one of the best things that we can do is to stress if possible quarantining if you're coming into contact with um, COVID of any sort. But again, like th this may be a non-answer, but I really do think that, um, you know, we've got the mandates of hand washing and social distancing and things of that nature. But when social distancing is not necessarily possible, depending on the home living situation, then that creates a whole other disconnect of um, like the science communication and the recommendations that are being communicated to that particular population. I mean, especially um, when we think about um, linguistic levels and also health literacy levels, um, those come into play very powerfully as well. Okay, so we have a question here that's um, maybe a little more specific to marketing our science, but it also goes back to the paywall discussion we're having earlier about um, what would be the best way to communicate uh, science? Is it maybe making a researchers post free PDFs to sites or um, encouraging members of the audience to contact scientists directly? Oh, I'm, I'm not going to present a simple answer to that one. It's, it's hard because it's, it's such a, a nuanced question and so it's a nuanced response. You know, there is no one best way to communicate science. And I think the, all those recommendations are great. Um, you know, being able to have more open access uh, 
uh, scientific studies, I think would be great. But then there's also that disconnect of how do we pull people to those studies? I mean, Dr. Hernandez mentioned, you know, our students like to, to read news articles, despite the fact we give them free access to all of these articles through our library database. Um, so, so it's, understanding that that just one avenue may not be the best yes having that that open access would be great but also recognizing that people are going to be getting information from um mass mass media sources and so um trying our best that we can that people are reading that that scientific information with a critical eye um to really deduce fact from fiction for themselves This is kind of a follow up on the critical uh, questions or critical thinking one before um, was how do we encourage adults to be more discerning about their sources of scientific information um, and how critical thinking is important so we're not fooled by anti science rhetoric. I can start us out, I guess. <laughs> um, uh, so I I really like to to look at how how people process in, information, and and one of the things that can be so both both a blessing and a curse are human reliance on cues, social cues, uh, familiar cues, and so things like our our political ideology or our um, uh, cultural background can can really um, cause us to to respond quickly to information, to absorb it quickly, come come to believe it very quickly. So um, coming up with different ways to kind of get people to slow down and think more critically about information can be um, such things as you know I, I talked about emotions or humor. Those can kind of shock people into maybe. Uh, reading something with greater depth than they would have uh, before. Um, so again, it's it's a nuanced response. Every every condition is going to be different. 